Joining us now is Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell. Good to have you here in person. It's nice to be here. So let's start with why this plea deal hit the impasse. So if you were in court or read about what happened on July the 26th, you have to ask yourself, as you just asked me, why? And there are only a few possibilities. Remember, it were the prosecutors who came forward and asked if there was a resolution possible. They're in charge of figuring out the form, the document, and the language. They did that. And so the possibilities are only, one, they wrote something and weren't clear what they meant. Two, they knew what they meant and misstated it to counsel. Or third, they changed their view as they were standing in court in Delaware. So to answer that question, I'll ask you a question and everybody else who's paying attention. What group of experienced defense lawyers would allow their client to plead guilty to a misdemeanor on a Monday, keeping in mind that they knew that there could be a felony charge on a Wednesday? That wouldn't happen. How could there be such a fundamental disagreement on this issue of how broad immunity um, would be for your client? Because that's what I understand it came down to in that transcript from July. It, it did come down to fundamentally that, and then a couple of issues as to what a judge's role could be in the proceedings that the prosecutors wrote the documents for. And how could it happen? I gave you the three possibilities. They wrote the language. They insisted on that language. They insisted on two different documents. With the understanding that it would be broad immunity. And with then, our understanding that it would be broad immunity. And the language, as the judge pointed out, is a very broad phrase. It says encompassing all the facts that were in the document that sets out the transactions. Mm -hmm. So what happened is one of three possibilities. And I again point out that no good defense attorney, and, yeah. this, and Mr. Biden had quite a few of them, would allow somebody to do a misdemeanor on a Monday thinking that three days later there could be a felony. Are you saying that the government prosecutors are incompetent? I'm saying there's one of three possibilities. And that was one of them, and, is what you're suggesting. Uh, I wouldn't say, so, I didn't use that word, you did. No, I said I did. that they changed their decision on the fly, standing up in court. Uh, the U.S. attorney said, due to this impasse, a trial is in order. Is a trial going to happen? Can you avoid one? Well, the answer to the second question is you can, but let me answer the first question. When you do not have a resolution and somebody pleads not guilty, as Hunter did, yeah. then two things happen. A judge could put together a scheduling order, the end of which would be a trial. There'd be discovery and motions, et cetera. So that's why that statement was made. So it's not inevitable. It's not inevitable, and I think- And you're trying I, to avoid one? I, we're, yes, we were trying to avoid one all along, and so were the prosecutors who came forward to us and were the ones to say, can there be a resolution short of a prosecution? So they wanted it, and maybe they still do want it. So in, that was dealing primarily with the tax-related charges. There was also this diversion agreement related to the gun possession. Is that part of the agreement still in effect? So there are two different agreements, mm -hmm. as you point out. And on July 26, what was very clear is that the prosecution presented the diversion agreement, which they signed, which we signed, and as an agreement of which they have described it as being a standalone, independent, bilateral agreement with two signatures on it, that agreement is different than the plea. The so plea has not fallen, the plea did not go forward. The diversion agreement is already filed in court, and it has the signatures necessary for it to be binding. You believe that it will remain binding? That, I believe that, the, that is. That Weiss is sticking with it. I can't answer what, ha look what happened on July 26. One of the possibilities is the prosecutors stood up and decided for lots of reasons that might be apparent to the viewer, they didn't like what people were saying about the deal they approved. Mm -hmm. And so I can't answer that. What I can say is that as recently as in the last week or two, they made a filing at court, they being the prosecutors, yeah. which called it a bilateral agreement between the parties. And if it's a bilateral agreement between the parties, it's an agreement that's in effect. One of the things that Judge Mary Ellen Noreka uh, brought up in court that day was uh, she said the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA, she asked specifically whether that would be um, handled within the scope of this deal. Is your client being investigated for that? Our client has been investigated in a five-year, long, thorough, painstaking investigation for every transaction that he was involved in. But that she include... specifically asked if immunity would cover that. But you asked me whether or not that has been part of the investigation. And after five years and what we know happened in the grand jury, 
of course that had to be part of what the prosecutor has already looked at, as well as every other false allegation made by the right-wing media and others, whether it's corruption or Farah or money laundering. That was part of what this prosecutor office had to have been looking over for five years. I can assure you that five years mm -hmm. concluded that the only two charges that made sense were two misdemeanors for failing to file, like millions of Americans do, and a diverted gun charge for the 11 days that Hunter possessed a gun. Everything else had been thoroughly looked at. So is that possible that yeah. they're going to revisit it? Let me answer it one way. If the now special counsel decides yeah. not to go by the deal, yeah. then it will mean that he or they decided that something other than the facts and the law are coming into play. We have to take a break and finish this conversation on the other side of it. Stick with us, Abby Lowell. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We want to continue our conversation with Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell. Let's pick up on where we left off and before let me do the that, break. I know we were a little rushed. So, to yeah. answer your question squarely, yes. people should keep in mind that while Mr. Weiss's title changed last week, he's the same person he's been for the last five years. He's a Republican U.S. attorney appointed by a Republican mm -hmm. president and attorney general who had career prosecutors working this case for five years, looking at every transaction that Hunter was involved in. Mm -hmm. So whether it was tax or the gun or possible any other charge, if anything changes from his conclusion, which was two tax misdemeanors and a diverted gun charge, the question should be asked, what infected the process? That was not the facts in the law. Or new evidence. I mean, are, are you confident your client won't face new criminal charges? I'm confident that if this prosecutor does what has been done for the last five years, look at the facts, the evidence, and the law, then the only conclusion can be what the conclusion was on July 26. It's new evidence. There's no new evidence to be found. Some of these transactions are years old. They've had people in the grand jury. They've had data that was provided to them. I don't know the possibility exists after this kind of painstaking investigation for there to be, oh my gosh, there's a new piece of evidence which changes. Mm -hmm. The only thing that will change is the scrutiny on some of the charges, for example, the gun charge. Uh, is it your position that Joe Biden was completely walled off from Hunter's business affairs? As you know, this is a focus in Congress. I understand. And my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is the facts and the evidence. Right. And the facts and the evidence that have been pursued by however many members of Congress and their staffs and media looking for any possible connection has shown time and time again it doesn't exist. If the most people that are criticizing the Biden family is, is that when the president calls his son every day and it goes on the speakerphone, he says hello to the people in the room. That is not an offense. That is nothing other than a loving father. Um, well, uh, the illusion of access is something, is a phrase that was used uh, by some in the room when Devin Archer, his former business partner, testified. But these foreign interests are very much being scrutinized. And within that plea memorandum that was released, it details a number of uh, Hunter Biden's financial transactions. He was in the throes of addiction. He wasn't able to pay his taxes at that time, but he also had income from a Chinese business conglomerate, um, an infrastructure investment company, a Ukrainian energy company, a Romanian business. Is there any chance that any of this crossed a line? If you say crossed the line, Here's again what we know. Five years, thorough investigation, looking at the Chinese, the energy company, the other foreign businesses he did. That was not something that wasn't looked at. Think of it this way. What did this group of prosecutors, who are Republicans appointed by Donald Trump, what did they have as a motive to turn the other way to anything that they found that would have indicated wrongdoing against Hunter Biden? There was none, and that's what is missing in the equation. Mm -hmm. Everybody keeps yelling that this was some sort of deal that was too good. What's not too good, what it's about it is that it reflects the five-year investigation, and no one has come up with a reason why anybody who was on the prosecution team would have gone easy on Hunter Biden if any of that that you just set out had ever been the case. So the answer is confident that after five years, mm -hmm. nothing should change other than the fact that Mr. Weiss now has a new title. We will be tracking what happens next, Abby, with your work uh, and Hunter Biden. We'll be right back. We're joined now by the Republican chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Ohio Congressman Mike Turner. It's good to have you back in you. studio. And I want to get you on a number of national security fronts, but you also sit on House Oversight, which is yes. investigating uh, the president's son, Hunter, um, and has called for U.S. Attorney David Weiss 
now <laughs> special counsel Weiss, to come and testify. Um, do you have confidence in him and his ability to conclude this in a fair way? Well, I, obviously there are concerns. Um, you know, one, like Catherine Heritage, I also looked at the appointment, uh, and the appointment seems more narrow than what Bill Barr had uh, given him. Uh, the um, Attorney General Barr, the, um, this says that it's limited to the case that, that was brought before him initially, that that's the scope, instead of all of the matters related to unpaid taxes. Um, the concern here, obviously, with, uh, with Barr being special counsel, excuse me, Weiss being special counsel, is that he was the one that allowed the statute of limitations to expire on some very critical felony uh, charges that could have been brought against Hunter Biden. Why would he um, have done that? The IRS uh, whistleblower said that it was um, that interference from the Department of Justice. There's some question as to whether or not it's prosecutorial misconduct, but it, it certainly could be you know, prosecutorial malpractice. In any event, when, you, when you've been given the charge uh, to handle uh, claims of, of such explosive nature and allow the statute of limitations to expire, resulting in, you know, Hunter Biden has in his pocket $125,000 worth of taxes that were owed to the United States that sure. as a result of these being expired remain in his pocket. Why would a U.S. attorney appointed by President Trump working under a Republican attorney general with career prosecutors have that level of conspiracy? Well, it's not conspiracy. That's an actual, that actually occurred, that those... Um, to deliberately allow for the statute of limitations to pass? I think those are questions that he has to answer. Okay. I know, why did this occur? The IRS whistleblowers said that it was interference from the Department of Justice that mm -hmm. allowed them to expire. The, the prosecutor, uh, Weiss, had been... Um, working with Hunter Biden and his attorney and actually getting waivers from for those statute of limitations period. Mm -hmm. And he stopped getting the waivers. So he certainly was knowledgeable, aware that it was going to be expiring. And then something occurred where he allowed uh, those to expire. But, you know, also his appointment is coming right on the heels of um, James Comer's release of bank records that indicate that we're now up to $20 million worth of funds that came from foreign uh, sources, Right, allegations in this, but but they're actual back, they're actual bank evidence. records. These are not no. The bank records are right up. The, the bank records are right on the website of the House Oversight Committee. Mm -hmm. Over twenty million dollars released August 9th that went to Hunter Biden, his family, and business associates that come from China, Russia. You know, as the chairman of the Arms, yeah. as chairman of the Intelligence Committee, serving on the Armed Services Committee. This is a great concern because you have foreign individuals that are making payments to the son of the vice president, now son of the right. president. And, and obviously, and you know, they're buying something. They weren't buying his business advice. They were buying influence. Um, uh, well, we, we just heard from uh, the attorney who had said, you know, no crime has been substantiated on that front. But I want to ask well, you. Well, he's representing well, Hunter Biden because he's in court. He is. Crimes. And he has a different standard than members of Congress because what you do is political and he has to meet a legal benchmark in court, as with those justices. Well, no, Department I think what he just did was actually right? very political. He's not in court when he's on your show. <laughs> fair, fair. Can I please ask you about Iran, though? I would love I to get to your about other um, hat that you wear as chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Um, tension's very high. The U.S. has sent more Marines, more, more ships to the region, and the president has brokered this tentative agreement with Iran to bring home these five Americans. Um, you've been briefed. Are you comfortable with the terms? Well, we, we haven't really been briefed, and that's really the concern. Uh, the, Congress has you know, updated on that. At this, at this point, right. we have not received the, the, the terms of the deal or even what the, uh, the proposed deal is. The administration has signaled that the release of these detainees is part of a broader negotiation with respect to reinstating some controls on the nuclear weapons and, and enrichment programs of Iran dating back to the JCPOA. And the concern is that New York Times has reported is that the administration may be pursuing an informal deal as opposed to the formal deal that we had before that had congressional oversight. Mm -hmm. and what we don't want, obviously, everybody wants the detainees to come home and, and hostages to come home. Uh, we want the administration to work diligently to bring American home, Americans home, whether in Iran or Russia or elsewhere. And our hearts certainly go out for them. Uh, but in this instance, the administration is signaling that this is part of a broader deal concerning uh, Iran's enrichment program. And if that becomes a secret deal, then that's obviously a great concern uh, to, the, to Congress. Um, these are de-escalatory first steps. You would consider that a what? I mean, do, well, I, I do, do, do you, are you opposed to no, what the well, administration is trying to do. I mean, there has well, we been need, reporting, and CBS has has also confirmed that Iran has, um, you know, at least reduced some of its uh, nuclear development. 
Well, actually, there's, there's no real reports of, of anything being reduced. They're currently at, at 60% I'm enrichment. I'm sure you read the Wall Street Journal prior, report that had prior, specifics they were at three of the and a half. uranium. They were at 3.5% of the JCPOA. Yes. They're at 60%. They had one year breakout with a, getting to the enrichment level that could result in a weapon. They're now weeks away. Uh, freezing them now, where before in the JCPOA agreement, they actually surrendered some of the enrichment that they'd had that was over the levels right. that were sought. In this, if we just have a deal that freezes where Iran is, and really without the understanding of all aspects of their program, because they had thrown out the UN inspectors mm -hmm. from the IEA, they'd removed the cameras from the sites. We really don't have the fidelity of understanding of where they are or what they're doing at so this So you point. would su support a broader diplomatic deal and negotiations with Iran to achieve that? Absolutely. And, and certainly okay. negotiations, I think, uh, as they're going forward, um, are, are, are certainly critical. But the terms of the deal are absolutely important because, you know, last time we had an insufficient inspection regime. We had terms that were critical that expired. In this instance, they appear to be uh, careening toward a deal that would be informal, not subject to congressional oversight, because we wouldn't know all the terms. In the last deal, it actually came before Congress for a vote. They had to disclose I, what the deals were. I remember. Right. And at this point, if it's <laughs> it informal, sailing. what we're concerned about is we don't want a secret deal with Iran. Very quickly, should Congress ban travel to Iran? I think it, it should... Except it should be certainly considered. I think the um, I know you're going to have coming up one yes. of the family members of one of the detainees, and and I think her message is incredibly important. People should not be going to Iran. Congressman, thank you very much thank for you. your time today. We'll be back in a moment. We're joined now by Netta Shargi. She is the sister of Ahmad Shargi, one of the four Americans who was recently transferred from Evan Prison to house arrest. Netta. Um, your brother's a step closer to freedom. Um, have you spoken with him? How is he? Not only have I spoken to him, but I actually saw his face on a video um, call that he made, and I was able to look into his eyes. I'm happy to say that he's, he's survived, he's alive, and we're so hopeful that we can have him at home in our arms, hopefully soon. Was that the first time you'd seen his face in some time? In about a year. Yeah. And, you know, I, I looked into his face and I just realized that everything we're doing is so worth it. You know, I looked into the eyes of an innocent American who has been through so much, as have the others. And so I'm just grateful for everything that's going on um, to try and, and get them home, finally. And this week has been great, you know, uh, but I have, there's just been so much speculation about the, the deal and the terms of the deal and all of that. By looking at him, I just I was reminded that we're talking about people. We're talking about innocent Americans, and let's just get them home soon. Um, the White House said there is still negotiating to do, and not everyone is safe yet, but September could be when the prisoners return home. Um, do you have any idea when that might be or what happens next? You know, my family and I are um, just on pins, like pins and needles. We're, we're, we're incredibly nervous about what happens next. And we don't know the details. I know there's lots of people out there who are speculating. I know for a fact that there's someone out there speculating who actually doesn't know anything about what comes next. So we just have to continue being optimistic. Um, realize that we're dealing with innocent Americans and do everything we can to get them home quickly and, you know, have an American story of, of celebration when they come home. It is so hard when it comes to hostage issues, particularly with Iran, because it's such a complex challenge for policymakers. But as you just said, you're talking about human beings and families at the other end of it. So when you hear the criticism of releasing billions of dollars to a regime who did this to your brother mm -hmm. and who has done this to others. Mm -hmm. How do you respond when people say, you're rewarding bad behavior and they're going to do it again if you release billions of dollars to Iran? You know, I've been advocating for other hostages and wrongful detainees in my role um, on the Bring Our Families Home campaign. I have seen families struggle and suffer I, I know the, the devastation that families go to, go through as they're trying to bring their loved ones home. I'm in that position myself right now. 
um, we can have issues, we can have discussions about how to prevent this from happening in the future, but we don't do that on the backs of innocent Americans. We need to bring them home, and then we can have discussions about how we can prevent this in the future. And you even heard Chairman Turner say he's not against bringing home. Americans, innocent Americans. Um, they should come home. We should do whatever we can to bring my brother home, to his parents, to his wife, to his lovely two daughters who you have met. Um, and then let's sit and have the discussions that we need about how we can prevent this from happening again. Um, your family has been on this program begging for an audience with President Biden, mm -hmm. uh, begging for more attention. Um, what do you think about what the administration has done? I wish they had done it sooner, but they're doing it now. I want them to finish this and bring my brother home, let my aging parents see him before it's too late. And I want them to work on bringing other Americans home. Um, we, we need their help, grateful to them. They need to do it faster and work on bringing other Americans home too. Should there be a ban on travel for Americans to Iran? I think that it's hard it's, when you have family. It's hard. Look, my brother went to Iran after his two daughters graduated high school and he was an empty nester and like thousands of other Americans with Iranian heritage went back as a tourist. You know, I, I don't want to prevent people from doing that. But the reality is we need to sit down together, both sides of the aisle and come up with ways that we can prevent this from happening again. But again, I say this, Margaret, we, we do that, but we don't do that on the backs of innocent Americans who are currently held hostage abroad. Every single one of these hostages, my brother included, has a family waiting for him, mm -hmm. for them. And they need to be brought home. And those discussions about prevention and deterrence um, can and should happen after they're home. Well, we will continue following that as well as your brother, and we wish you well. Thank you so Netta, much. Thank you for sharing your story at this thank sensitive you. time. Thank you very much. We'll be back. Security has been stepped up in downtown Atlanta ahead of possible charges that could be handed down against former President Trump this week. There is new research that support for political violence is on the rise following Trump's numerous indictments to date. Robert Pape, a professor at the University of Chicago, joins us now with details. It's good to have you back. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and I know you've been tracking this really troubling trend uh, in American politics um, for a while here. And the survey you did in June on the second federal indictment of former President Trump, after that point, what impact did you see? Is it feeding more anger or is it just sort of baked in. What we're seeing is the country as a whole on the edges, but now moving into the mainstream, is becoming much more angry, much more radicalized. And this is particularly happening just in the last three months. Um, what is occurring, um, I study this not from the perspective of a political pollster who's ahead in a political horse race, but from 30 years of experience in studying political violence. And the biggest picture to take away from the survey of our Dangers to Democracy tracker is that political support for, support for political violence is now breaching into the mainstream. That's different. It's not just about Oath Keepers, Proud Boys. It is now breaching into the mainstream, and we're seeing the consequences of that in many ways in our society. Uh, in looking at some of the research you shared with us, one of the things that stood out, you are seeing this radicalization on both sides of the political spectrum. 30 million people, according to your numbers, think the use of force is justified to prevent Donald Trump from being president. 18 million think it's justified to restore Trump to the presidency. Exactly. What we're seeing is not simply um, a manifestation on the right. The, that is absolutely important. And there's no doubt that January 6th, the crowd that sieged the Capitol, is something that has not happened on the left. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to draw that equivalence. 
But nonetheless, what we need to look at are the sentiments on both the right and the left that are being radicalized to millions and millions of uh, Americans. And this is important because political, uh, these sentiments are a bit like uh, understanding wildfires, the first part of your show. It's the dry kindling that is so important that we can measure in advance. We can't measure political, uh, political uh, scientists like myself or meteorologists a campfire that could set off that kindling or power lines that could set off that kindling. What we can actually measure and see whether it's growing, shrinking, are the sentiments for political violence in the country. And those are growing. And it's important not because every one of those people is going to commit political violence, but because it helps to legitimate political violence, and it is the pool of people that ultimately do commit acts of political violence. Which is your response to those who say, well, that's a small percentage. You think that could have huge ramifications. And, and we're seeing yeah. those ramifications in Utah, but Utah is not an exception to this. Or You're talking well, about the 74-year-old the man who was shot by the FBI when they were trying to serve a warrant to his home. Um, because he had been making threats online about President Biden. And what's important is not that we're just seeing the rise of online chatter in the last few years. Remember, we studied that with ISIS as well. What we're seeing now is the rise of determined threats by individuals. The man in Utah made threats online in March, was visited by law enforcement, and then did it again, this time brandished a gun. Right. Now, that's a determined threat. If we look at the man who was arrested in front of Obama's home just the month before that, he was at January 6th breaking into the Capitol. Um, right. Then he surveilled the area the day before in a 17-minute video. Then he comes back with guns and bombs. Brett Kavanaugh attacker before that, the Pelosi attacker before that. These are determined, what we're seeing is determined individuals, not simply online chatter. And our surveys, this tracker of dangers to democracy, help to give and inform the situational awareness and how it's changing in our country. With the, the, the older man in Utah, um, this was online threat posting. Mm -hmm. But there are individuals around him who have said he wasn't necessarily a threat. So there's some probing of whether the, the political rhetoric matches actual intent. And that will be How do the, you measure that? That will be the case in every single instance of a specific individual. There's always psychosocial circumstances. There's always biographical constraints of being able to execute violence itself. Um, those will be um, often vary and become unique to every single individual. It's not the one individual case, Margaret. It's this pattern that we're seeing now going back now years of determined, normally FBI comes, law enforcement knocks on your door, says, hey, we don't like this threat to the president, maybe you should knock that off. That often just goes away. That's not what happened in this case. What happened in this case is they ramped up. They got more aggressive as President Biden was about to come to Utah. So Biden is coming closer to him. It is not at all weird that then, that, I mean, just think of what had happened if, if something had gone wrong and the law enforcement had not gone knocked on this man's door. We don't want to wait until we actually have to react after an event. And so, but this isn't a lone wolf. This is yeah. not a lone case. What we're seeing is case after case after case of this. Mm -hmm. And we should go back to January 6th, yes. where the crowd is chanting, hang Mike Pence, okay. building a gallows, and I not know. just sort of dismiss that as well. Is that just chat? We're not. And that's why we're going to continue following that. Thank you. That's it for this week. I'm Margaret Brennan.